Well, we're here to talk about complications of TAVR, and complications do happen. Um, you know, when we do uh, imaging for TAVR, we want to ensure proper prosthesis placement. We assess the function of the prosthesis, ventricular function, other valve disease, and then, of course, what we're going to talk about now is look for complications. Um, and we'll just go through examples. Now, one of the complications that can occur, and it doesn't occur too much anymore with the newer prostheses, but it used to occur more often, is significant periprosthetic AR. And it could be from a large aortic annulus, undersizing the prosthesis, um, asymmetric cusp calcification, LV outflow tract calcification, you know, there could be a septal bulge in the interventricular septum, or we didn't place the valve at the right place. So we'll just take an example here just to illustrate and uh, show it. we'll have a vote here. How much periprosthetic AR do you think is there? So this is a TE view, long axis on the left and short axis on the right. Is it mild, mild to moderate, moderate, or do you think it's severe? All right, so the majority thought it was moderate, and the second was mild to moderate. And, you know, I thought it was moderate. Um, if you called it mild to moderate, I, I, I think that you're not out of uh, control there. But there is uh, guidelines that help us judge this. Uh, I mean, they're a little bit arbitrary. They're not really validated, but a consensus of experts called the, the VARC Consortium uh, and essentially the first go around said that if you look at the short axis view and it's critical that you're right at the level of the valve, not in the LV outflow tract, not above it, um, if it was less than 10% the circumference, we would call it mild. If it was more than 20% of the circumference, they called it severe. Now the VARC consortium then revised that and the most recent guidelines say if it's more than 30% of the circumference at the, sh at the level of the valve, we would call it uh, severe. So just keep that in mind. It's a bit arbitrary, but that's what the experts say. Now, sometimes it's not so easy. I mean, here's another case of there is periprosthetic leak, you can see here. Here's a deep transgastric view. That can sometimes accentuate the jet. It fans out pretty good. Uh, that patient ended up uh, having an aortogram, their creatinine was good, and there was only mild AR. The key thing is when you assess it, uh, to look right at the valve level in the short axis view, use multiple other imaging modalities. Be aware that you can have reversal of flow in the descending thoracic aorta due to stiffening of the aorta, and there not, may not be significant aortic regurgitation. But if you don't have significant regurgitation, in the descending aorta, chances are it's not that significant an amount of AR. So here's a case where we're deploying the TAVR valve. One of the rare cases they didn't ask us to pull back our probe and I see it going up and here it is under fluoroscopy. All is well, but then, now this isn't so subtle. We see a lot of periprosthetic regurgitation here. And whether you call it moderate to severe or severe, it's way too much to leave behind. So the decision was made to do a second balloon inflation. And after the second balloon inflation, the result was much better, probably mild residual regurgitation. Now regarding this second balloon inflation, it does occur. This is a series of, uh, in the early days, of transapical uh, TAVR. But it occurred, they did a second inflation in about 5% of the cases and they had to put in a second valve in about 4%. But with the newer prosthesis, this is much, much rarer. I mean, I can't rem remember the last time we had to do uh, multiple inflations or a second valve with a new generation of prostheses. Now, this is a patient that suddenly developed hypotension post tabard and this is what you don't want to see when you do the aortogram. And on echo, there was a tiny pericardial effusion, but you can see here there's been annular rupture and this patient had to go emergently to the OR. So anytime there's hypotension, you have to make sure that there's no fusion, uh, make sure no other co complication has occurred. So we want to size the valve. The sizing of the valve is really the key for periprosthetic leak. If we undersize the prosthesis, there's going to be paravalvular regurgitation. 
But if we oversize the prosthesis or have to do a second balloon inflation sometimes, um, it increases the risk of annular rupture. Where we want to be is in the sweet spot, nirvana. And both by TE and transthoracic, this is a, a series from Germany, this asymmetric cusp calcification really was a predictor of significant periprosthetic regurgitation. And you could detect it by both CT or echo. Uh, both are good at detecting this asymmetric cusp calcification, but it is something to look at. Most of the time, uh, the alveopho tract and annulus is more oval than circular, although it may become more circular after you de deploy the device. But here, more on a more serious matter, here's an example of asymmetric cusp calcification. So here we see the TE, and look at this huge chunk of calcium here, but there's not so much anteriorly, although there is a little bit of drop out there. And you can see that here by 3D as well. After deployment of a core valve. Now here's the core valve in place. So here's one strut of the core valve, here's the other. But that chunk of calcium right there that we visualized on the pre-imaging prevented that core valve from totally expanding. And there was significant periprosthetic leak right where that occurred. And so then you have to make a decision. Do you want to try and expand that core valve? And that's not without uh, problems as well. But it was predicted by that asymmetric cusp calcification. Got to look at the landing zone. It can be predicted by CT as well uh, in this situation. So if there is procedural hypotension, what do we look for? Well, we look for severe AR, make sure there's not tamponade. I showed you the case of aortic annular <coughs> rupture, a VSD that we caused. Is there new valve disease, severe MR, TR, uh, or valve dysfunction, LV dysfunction? Well, here's a case early on in our series. And, and like I said, most of the time, I'd say 95% of the time, we're just doing transthoracic echo. And with the new generation TAVR valves, it's been a long time since I've seen any complication besides just a pacemaker. But here's a case early on where we didn't place the valve probably in a good position. It's too low. Here you can see it in the long axis view. It's actually interfering a little bit with the mitral apparatus. And in fact, there's quite a bit of both prosthetic and periprosthetic regurgitation. And now our valve is really too low. It's in the ventricle. So that's not a good situation. Fortunately, they were able to retrieve this valve. Here's another case, uh, a 79-year-old man, severe symptomatic AS. It was part of the cohort B study uh, of the partner trial. Uh, had severe AS, nothing subtle about it, looks severe, tri leaflet valve. Now watch closely here. Look at this pacemaker lead as they're deploying the valve. It became displaced and they lost capture. And next thing you know, there goes the valve, squeezing out. So I'll let that again. Take a look here at the pacemaker lead. And unfortunately, they lost capture, and there goes the valve. So it's very important, and this has really changed uh, both balloon valvuloplasty and tab replacement. When you pace very rapidly, the heart doesn't eject, and that's very important to maintain a good placement of the valve, the tab valve. And in our case, I just showed you, unfortunately, they lost capture, and the heart ejected as they were deploying the valve. But we try and try again. Please note that this is the new TAVR valve, and this time they had good capture and it was placed well. What they did with the other valve is they dragged it back to the descending thoracic aorta and deployed it. But we really can't call that TAVR, but I guess you can still call it TAV e uh, because it is, a, it is a valve in the descending thoracic aorta, two for the price of one. You can see both uh, prostheses there. And there was really no gradient there. Now, this is a, a patient, the uh, 79-year-old after the TAVI, uh, who has two valves. The one we put in the uh, aortic position looks great. And here's what it looked like in the descending aorta. I really couldn't find any gradient there at all. And it was pretty good laminar flow. But we have to call that TAVI, not TAVR. This was an unfortunate patient that had some kind of a hypercoagulable state at the time the valve was deployed, 
and you can see here, developed an acute severe thrombus right on the Tabra valve. And in fact, here now, a few minutes later, the thrombus has grown and now is even crossing across the uh, mitral valve. Unfortunately, this patient was not a surgical candidate and part of the cohort B trial, came to our CCU um, and, and didn't make it. So acute thrombus can occur. This patient had some kind of a hypercoagulable state uh, because they were pulling clots even out of the uh, blood that was coming out of the groin. Now, Dr. Connolly and uh, others have mentioned this uh, important uh, paper a few years ago um, looking at the incidence in a particular uh, type of a Tabra valve. But the important thing is when they did uh, imaging by CT, they found a much higher incidence of thrombi on the valve by CT than we thought we would see. And if they gave uh, Coumadin, you didn't see that thrombus. So it's something to think about. And maybe I'll ask, we'll ask the panel to clarify, because I, I do know that a lot of centers after TAVR are still just using dual antiplatelet therapy. And uh, I think you've got to be careful. Now, importantly, in that study, and this was pointed out also by our speakers, the CT was very good at picking up these thrombi. Sometimes you see abnormalities in echo, but this is very subtle, and we didn't see too much in this particular example from their paper. So CT is a good way to pick that up, the complication of TAVR. And in my opinion, if you're not going to anticoagulate, you better do serial imaging by CT uh, at least a month out just to make sure that nothing's happened. So, you know, complications happen. These are just a list of some, cardiac perforation with tamponade, rupture of the aortic root, traumatic VSD or septal hematoma, avulsion or, or dissection of the ascending aorta, new or worsening TR and MR, uh, and a paravalvular leak. And of course, we didn't mention the pacemaker, but that's one of the most common complications still.